Welcome to the Mr. Universe Meets podcast in association with the Mansformation Programme. Now, the Mansformation Program is a 12-week program for men that want to level up their training, nutrition, lifestyle, and mindset so that they can live in a body that looks great, feels great, and has unstoppable energy. On this podcast, we're going to be speaking to athletes that have reached the top of their game to understand their mindset, habits and routines, and what makes them elite. I want you to take advantage of the lessons they teach and go and smash your own goals. I would love it if you guys would like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy the podcast. Okay, cool. Right, so today we're joined by Liam, the Hitman Harrison. He's an eight-time world Thai boxing champion. Um, and, and you know your guest is a bit of a big deal when he's been on Joe Rogan twice. <laughs> right? So like no pressure here from me at all. So, <laughs> so just lower your expectations a little bit, mate. So, uh, what was that like? What was that like going on Rogan? Do you know what? He's a really cool guy. So I will never forget the first time I went on there. So I'll go in and he's this big, massive like big studio, like big metal container. But go inside, he had like a big video game on his wall. He had his gym, his mats for jujitsu, his kettlebells. And then he had, from one end of the room, which were 90 metres, he had archery, you know, the, the big bow and arrow, because he hunts all his own meat, all his own elk and stuff like that, doesn't he? So I said to him, I went, hit bullseye then from here, because he's got the big board over in the room. He walked over, he picked this big bow up. He didn't even like look, he drew it back and went bang about that fast bullseye straight in the middle i was like what the fuck i like that some superhero stuff do you know what i mean i was like i said hey, how did you he said just practice every day he said when i'm hunting my meat he said i don't want to like hit the elk like in its ribs or anything or make it suffer he said i want it in the heart from 50 meters away i need to make sure it dies like that no pain i like, oh, fair enough but i said that was one of the coolest things i've ever seen i said i won't ever forget that um but yeah other than that he's just doing a really cool guy he's uh I see that, but, he's but, easy to talk to yeah yeah, I see that he put a post a video yesterday. There was some guys like kicking a football, Alex, and then Alex Pereira, yeah, and then yeah. just let one go, and it just straight foot football. That were Alex Pereira. He's, uh, he's fighting Izzy for UFC title soon. But I, as soon as I saw that on Pereira's uh, thing, I actually sent it to, to Joe. I said, "You'll appreciate this, mate." And uh, he said, "Ah, oh, that's right up my street." Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you trained with him as well when you was over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, when I went on the podcast first, the first time with Vinny Shawman, he said, "Oh." I've, you've got Liam with you. He said, well, Liam do a bit of training with me and stuff. So we turned up with his pads and stuff like that. And then we did a bit with him. And I, I know people talked about how hard he kicks and stuff like that. But honestly, mate, when he fucking kicked me, it, it shook my skull. It was that it was that heavy. He has got some nasty, nasty power. He's, he's only just a little bit taller than me. He's only around 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, but he's a, he's a little unit in... You say, what's he weighing at? He's about 90 kilo, I think. Right, okay. So when you're only that short and that stocky, he's solid and he's got a lot of, lot of power. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool, right. So um, let's get let's get on to the, the fighting anyway. So last month you were in the um, you fought for the one bantamweight uh, yeah. world title. Um, you obviously blew your knee out. How, how was that going? Yeah, yeah, that ended in fucking complete disaster, mate. Uh, that were a, what, <laughs> what was it you actually did to it? So I've torn my meniscus and my patella tendon. Um, luckily, my patella tendon hadn't tore off the bone. It's just got a tear in it. Uh, so I'm hoping to be back training by the end of October, full training again. Um, I'm hoping to be back in the, the cage or the ring January time. It, and there's a show in Bangkok that I'm, I'm aiming for. I want to be on that. I don't want to rush my rehab and stuff, but I've done my knee in before and I know what rehab I need to do is to get myself back where I need to be. So I don't want to rush, but at the same time, time's of the essence because I'm 37 in a couple of weeks. So I need to get back in there and have one more or two more solid years before I retire. I'm not going out on that, that nightmare that happened obviously last month. So... Yeah, like I say, time's of the essence. I just want to get back in there. I'm, I'm smashing. I'm back doing my rehab at the minute. Uh, I can box. I can work around the injury a little bit. I just can't kick and pivot or anything like that at the minute. So I'm hoping end of October I'll be back in full training and I can push towards another fight. I was going to say you are still able to do something though. Yeah, moment, yeah, yeah. I'd go insane if if I didn't. I can't. I can't just be like locked up in my in my house with like not being able to do it. I will lose the plot. Um, so yeah, I can box. I'm doing my S&C still. I'm doing a lot of knee rehab and stuff like that. I'm allowed on my walk bike, so I'm doing a lot of miles on my walk bike and stuff like that. So I'm just keeping myself active. There's always keeping, something you can do. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You can always work around some of it. So I'm keeping my fit, fitness levels up. I'm keeping my weight down, which is important. Because um, the last time I, I did my knee and I were on crutches for a lot longer. So I'm, my weight skyrocketed then and it was a struggle bringing it back down. So yeah, everything. I can't complain. Not, I, you know, it was shit what happened, but it could have been a lot worse because when it happened, 
I was thinking, oh, I hope this isn't my ACL or my MCL or someone that's going to put me out for six months to a year because at my age you don't come back from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so although there's a couple of there were a couple of tears in the in the tendons and stuff like that, it's been easily treated and I've only been off for like two months, which isn't too bad. I, I could see the frustration in you once you'd done it and you knew you couldn't stand back up yeah. and it was you were just like rocking back and just like so you could see it in you. I mean, how I was frustrated so was angry. that? Yeah, I worked my entire life towards this title shot. I mean, obviously I've won eight world titles. And I've won some of the best world titles there are, but this one is is the pinnacle of combat sport. To hold that title, every you know what I mean. That I've dreamt about being at the very, very top and being the number one guy for all my whole career, and I worked myself into a position where it was going to be possible. And the guy who was fighting, absolute beast, one of the greatest fighters of this generation. I was just really looking forward to throwing down and having a a proper war with him and giving the all the the fans a treat who were there, all the entire world who were watching give them a real hard fight and then that happened and we, the fight didn't even get going it was literally I think in the first 90 seconds that it happened there were a kick before the last kick where I, where I went down that did that did it you, I put it on my Instagram you could see in slow motion my knee like jarred and went in and I knew it had gone then and I remember looking at him and he looked at me and I knew that he knew, that I knew my knee had gone, do you know what I mean? So it was like, oh no, I thought he's going to kick me again and then he kicked me again and I, I just couldn't get back up. Yeah. So it was, it was just one of them things. I mean, like my, my knee's been kicked a million times and that's never happened. So I think just the angle and it, it were obviously ready to go. They were obviously damaged saying it were obviously ready to done. But it was the, the frustration, that's what the worst thing was, of just not being able to give a proper account of myself, not being able to give a proper shot at the belt, not being able to give the, the fans and the crowd have all paid good money and all expected a war. And obviously not being able to to win that belt, which is what I've dreamed of my entire career. But everyone loves a comeback story. So that's why I always want to get back in there, ASAP, get this rehab done on my knee, get it bulletproof, and then we'll go again. Was that your first shot at that title? Yeah, it was, yeah. Um <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, that was the first, the first shot. I, I've had a, quite a few fights under their banner now, so and it's like it's so good to fight for them. Like there's big bonuses involved. There's the entire world watching the production, everything about fighting for them. I love it. So, like I said, I just want to get back in there ASAP. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so let's let's in true podcast style, we go back to the start, the start of the beginning. Um, let's circle back to, to to the beginning. Like, who are you? Where are you from? And how did you get started in Thai boxing? So I'm from Leeds, a uh, rough part of Leeds. I'm from Leeds 9. Um, I was 13 when I first walked in the Bad Company gym. And I remember the, the first time I walked in, I was like, oh shit, like you smell the the oil, the liniment that they're all in. And you, I saw Bad Company gym has been always been one of the best gyms in England. So even when I first started, I think it was 99 or 2000, about 1999, I think I first walked in the doors. They had British champions and English champions. And I remember walking through, and I were only 13, I walked through the door and I saw them kicking the pads and smashing the pads. And I thought, wow, this is, I've never, I've never seen all like this before. I didn't really know what Thai boxing was then because it, it wasn't really a, a big thing. I'd only gone down because I was playing football a lot and my cousin said, oh, do you want to come down and do this? It'll be good for your fitness. It'll teach you how to fight as well. And you, you know what Leeds like, especially Leeds nines like. It's a rough area, isn't it? You know, you've got a gym there yourself. Yeah, you know what yeah, it's like yeah, around yeah. there. If you can't fight <clears> around <throat> there, you'll get eaten alive. So I said, yeah, I'll come down. I'll do a bit and we'll see how it goes. And I went down and I saw this and I was just hooked straight away. And I remember I really enjoying my training for the first month and like smashing pads and smashing bag. And I really enjoyed that. But after the first month, we got to spa. And then after the first sparring session, I was like, wow, that, that was it. I was absolutely, I was obs obsessed by it. Like, I just totally zoned in on that. And then that was it. And the rest is history from there. Yeah. And you say you play a bit of football as well? Yeah. You know, I played at a good level. I played, you played Farsi Celtic. Um, so when what, I, what level were they at then? They I, were semi-pro. I, I, I'm a York fan, so yeah, I, yeah, we yeah. used to play Fars League, like, non-league and, and stuff like that. So yeah, were, they, were they like National League North or a little bit below that? Uh, level? Yeah, I can't remember what league yeah. they were in at the time, but they were semi-pro. I was with them from now being 13 till 18. Uh, from 17 and 18, though, I wasn't really playing much. I was on bench a lot and because I, all my time was just taken up by tie boxing. And when I was 17 and 18, I was fighting at a very, very high level and I shouldn't have even been playing any football, really. Um but yeah, I played I played for them when I was around 15, 16 ish. I had scouts watching me from Leeds, Barnsley, and Sheffield Wednesday. I were at a very good level. A couple of years in row in a row, I were top scorer in our league and stuff. But like I say, like the 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 deeper I got in with tie boxing and the more fights I had and I would the more of a backseat football just started yeah, to take. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I remember there's, um, uh, you know, so you see like footballs when they have a bit of a ding dong on pitch, it's a bit of pathetic pushing. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. imagine, uh, you know, if someone was doing that to you right. on the pitch? <laughs> uh, do, do, do you remember there's a guy called Curtis Woodhouse? Yeah, that, okay, yeah I remember him, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he used to play for, I don't know, a York fan, so I think he played for like Worcester Diamonds or something yeah. like that. And one of our midfielders, there was a tackle, and he got up and he squared up to, to this Curtis Woodhouse and like, Oh shit! What we're doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> professional boxer outside yeah, as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, just turned around and, and walked off. So, um, but yeah. So, so you've 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 got into bad company. Um, who were your early mentors in there? So Richard, straight from the off, um, because when I started, Richard was still my still my coach. Now he's been my coach since I was thirteen. He was still fighting back then. So the first time I ever went to a proper Thai boxing show, it was to watch him fight. And I remember he, he was fighting for a world title at Leeds Town Hall against the Japanese champion. So they brought one at best over from Japan and they were fighting. And I remember watching the fight at the time and it was one of the best, it's still to this day, it's one of the best fights I've ever seen. It was absolutely ridiculous. And then in round three, Richard knocked this Japanese guy down. And then round four, he was still winning. And then in round five, I thought, oh, he's won, he's got the world title here. And then in round five, the Japanese guy knocked Richard down. And then when the bell went, because of the two knockdowns for each one, they give it a draw. Even though I still thought Richard did enough in the other rounds to take the fight, they give it a draw, and I will honestly that was one of the best fights I've I've ever seen. So like Richard's always been one of my like my early inspirations. And then obviously the more I got into the sport, more I used to go to different shows. I used to follow a few other English guys. And then the first times when I started seeing the Thais fight, I was like, wow, this is next level with the oh I always had the big legs and the big calves and the big kicks and the noise it used to make when they'd come over and they'd fight another English guy and they'd kick him and it. Would, and I'm like, this is what I want to. I want to get to to this level. So, what what sort of impact has Richard had on your life and, and your career? You know what? He's been like my second dad. To be fair, when I was, I was a little bit of a little bastard when I was younger. Like I say, you know what it's like running around on the streets of LS fifth, LS nine. Sorry, when I'm when you're 14, 15 years old. So, in between Thai boxing, if I'm like running around on the streets, getting up to all kinds of no good, my dad would just fucking rag me down to the gym. Say, listen, if I'm not, you're not gonna listen to me. If I'm not gonna be a discipline, you just throw me in the gym and go, Richard. Telling me can't train no more. And I'm like, oh no, please, please, I'll, I'll behave, honestly. So that's what got me off the streets, really. When I was like 14, 15, I was knocking around with some like pretty div divs, to be honest. You know what I mean? A lot of them went to jail, a lot of them got in a lot of trouble and stuff like that. And that's luckily Thai boxing brought me away and Richard took me away from that. Every night after after school, when they're out on the streets getting up to no good, doing all what they were doing, I were in the gym. Um and like I say, when Richard threatened me with, said, oh, you, you won't be able to come to this gym anymore if you don't start fixing up. So when he said that to me and threatened me with that, that was like, right, okay, I better sort myself out here. And then I took me son totally away from that. And I was just in gym every night then. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember Richard from, um, uh, so I, when I was, I was 15, so about 99, about the same sort of time as yeah. you, um, I, I started doing a little bit and it was in York, at, um, a guy called Pierre. Oh, Pierre Mahon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a class. Uh, and Richard, I think, because, Pierre used to train at Bad Company as yeah, well, he and did, yeah. Richard came over a couple of times. Well, that's obviously where like Rich Cadden and stuff like that. So uh, I remember him coming down there. But have you got any other any other mentors or anyone that had a big influence on your the, the fighting side of things with you, or is it? You know, yeah, is my it... cousin Andy. He's always been uh, a, a real my big inspiration to me. Like he's gone under radar a little bit. His, his career should have had a lot more traction than it than it did. He, he, he's also a five time world champion. He's the one who took me down to the gym. He's been involved in some of the most brutal fights I have ever, ever seen in my life. I've never seen anyone so small, but with such a big heart than what he's got. I, I mean, I've seen him in fights where I remember he, with the first time he won, he won his sniper, his second world title he won. He got kicked in the face and he never used to wear a gum shield when he used to fight, which well, to be fair, I didn't until I got to about 25. But he got kicked in the face and because he didn't have a gum shield and his lip ripped and was just hanging off. And I remember when the referee came to the corner in between rounds, he said, put the towel over my mouth. So we had to put the towel on his mouth so the ref couldn't see it. We sent him back out for the round. next round. He won the fight and got literally dragged straight out the ring, put in an ambulance and took to hospital for plastic surgery. I remember once as well in round two of the fight, he came back and he sat down in the corner and went, I brought my arm. I went, you haven't brought your arm. I said, shut the fuck up. He went, I brought my arm. He said, put me arm. He said, put my right hand against my head so I can defend myself. I won't move it. So I get, put his arm up there against his head and he kept it there for the rest of the fight. And he won the fight, got out the ring, again, straight to hospital, surgery on his arm, metal plates in it. He's done that a few times. I've never seen anyone have to go beyond the call of duty like he does. And so if anyone's watching and wants to watch some crazy fights, just put Andy Housen in, in YouTube and you'll see 
honestly, some absolutely brutal moments. And yeah, no one had a heart like him. So he's always been a big inspiration to me as well. And he's also now one of my main trainers as well. He, anyone will see like on Instagram who watches me train, like when I'm smashing the pads, it's always with Andy and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So how long were you at Bad Company before you actually had a fight? About six months. Okay. Yeah, which was... Only young then? Yeah, I was, I was 13 when I had my first, like, I had fights and I had all pads on and stuff like that. Um, like, obviously juniors can't just let them send them in with no padding on and stuff like that. So I did that when I was 13. But I was big for my age. My fight weight now is 145 pounds. My first fight when I was 13 was at 130 pounds. So it's not that much of a, a difference. Even though I'm only small now, I was pretty big back then. I was still similar height to what I am now. So I did that junior fight. And then when I was 14, I had another one and they made me put all these pads on again. And I just said to Rich, I'm not doing that again. Today, I'm not putting all them pads on. I felt like, you no, know, like a, a turtle when he's on his back and he can't get up. I remember I got swept and I went floor and I had all these pads on and I could barely get off at floor. And I said, no, I'm not doing that again. I said, well, you got to be 16 to fight. Like, and I said, well, lie then. I said, tell him I'm 16. And then the fight came up. He said, right, I've got this guy. He's 16 years old. I'll say you're 16, you can fight pro, you'll get paid. And I remember I got 30 quid or only 14. It was fucking best day of my life. My son just going to give you 30 quid when you're 14. Straight down park, Brilliant. bottle of vodka, yeah. on swings, <laughs> on roundabout. But yeah, we did that. I had this fight and I remember I turned up and it was pro, buzzing. It was on one of the biggest fights of north of England at the time, like one of the biggest shows. And uh, one of my favourite fighters, he was on his main event and stuff. And I thought, oh, this is going to be amazing. And then... I got on the scales, my opponent got off the scales, and I remember I said to Andy, I said, he looks a bit older than 16. And I watched him go outside, he jumped in his golf GTI and drove off, and I thought, oh, fucking, I've been stitched up here. It turned out he was 19, but it didn't matter. I knocked him out in first round anyway, so... You were 14 and I he was 14, 19. I was 14, yeah, and yeah, I knocked him out in round one. It's on, it's on YouTube, that fight. Did you ever... Was there much fear going into fights like that? I mean, I, like, I was, at, at school, you're like, if the kid was the year above you... He was automatically harder, right? Joey and you're taking on guys five years older than you. Yeah. What was? I was completely no, no fearless, you. mate. I, when I was that young, I, I was just so obsessed by the the sport and fighting and stuff like that. It didn't even cross. When I look back at it now, I think, fuck me. But obviously, Richard must have been, he must have like believed in my potential so much to even match me like that because he said to me, he said, I won't do it with any of my fighters now. He said, I only did it with you because I knew I knew what you were capable of. I've, I've watched your training. I knew what you were capable of. I said, I won't do it with anyone else unless I, I knew down, like, in my heart, like, what they could do. I went out 15, I fought a 28-year-old and I knocked him out as well. Um, so, like, that was just the trajectory of my career then. I, I'd started fighting these adults. I then couldn't go back to fighting people around me on age. I'd started fighting these adults and it just went, that's just how it went. And then by the time I was 17, I was UK number one. Did they know that you was... 15 at this. So, <laughs> I remember I fought, he were a world champion kickboxer when I was 15. I fought him and he'd never fought Thai boxing, um, but he was a world champion in kickboxing, similar sport, but very different at the same time. And I absolutely obliterated his, like kickboxers, they don't really block low kicks and I, I obliterated his leg and I stopped him in round two. And then I remember he came up to the bar afterwards and he limped over to me and went, oh, I'll get you a pint. And then one went behind the bar, I went, have you got any idea? I went, Oh, no. He went, how old are you? I went, 15. He went, oh, I don't believe it. He was devastated. <laughs> then I thought, oh, do you know what? I might lie to people when they ask me like that. I thought, I felt bad for him. Yeah, I thought yeah, I've just yeah. battered him in front of all his family and friends. And now I've got to fucking tell him I'm only 15 as well. Oh, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's just how it went. Then like, just, yeah, I, these people didn't seem to have a problem with fighting someone that young either. So that's what no, it is. Game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you went on a bit of a roll at the start of your pro career then? Yeah, I, I went my first 29 professional fights unbeaten which is there's not many people who, who do that like especially like I there's a fighter at minute Danny Rodriguez he's 35 and all but other than other than him I don't know anyone else who's got that because there's so many different ways to lose in Muay Thai it's not like boxing where you get protected either obviously I've, like I say I won't get him protected I was getting thrown into the deep end I was fighting good level fights and like I say by the time I was 17 I was fighting for the UK number one spot after that, I fought my first fighter from Thailand who'd had 75 pro fights. After that, I went to Japan when I, and fought the number one guy in Japan and I knocked him out. And I was only 17 years old here and I'm getting all this experience and all this life experience. It was all just like a bit of a, a bit of a whirlwind, to be fair. It was very pretty untouchable at that point. Well, when I was 17, obviously, I, I was, you know what, I'll tell you, I was worse when I was 15 because I was just a cocky knobhead. 
And I'd been knocking out all these adults, and I just remember thinking, yeah, fucking hell. Do you know what I mean? And you can imagine what a 15-year-old were like. I was getting paid to fight. So all my other friends were like, fucking hell, you're getting paid a couple of hundred quid when you're fighting and stuff like that. And yeah, I was just a cocky div. And then I got to like 16 and 17, that, that grew out of me and stuff. And I started like really getting my head down. I was going to go to college. I went to college for about a week. I went went back home, went, I'm not doing it. I said, I want to be a pro fighter, mum, to my mum and dad. And you know what? Fair play to them for supporting me through for my dream and what I did because not many other parents would have done that because they, my dad believed in me. I saw my mum like full throttle from the get-go and I said oh I think I was about 15 when I started saying oh, I want to be a pro fighter I want to be a pro fighter and they were saying listen if you can do it you can do it I went I remember I went to college for like I can't remember what I was studying it was some bullshit like media and something else I thought what am I doing if I don't want to be here so I went for a week and then just came home and I'm not going back I'm done um so yeah but like I say when I got to 17 that's when the fight started getting harder I fought for the UK number one spot against the the guy with current UK number one um, I, I, I battered him I, I, I won really really convincingly and then my fight after that I think that he was meant to be fighting a Thai fighter and they said listen well, you've, you've just took his spot four weeks time do you want to fight a Thai and I was like oh shit I think I'd only had about 16 17 pro fights at the time and I knew Thais had all had God knows how many fights. I think he'd had 75 pro fights. They do have a ridiculous number of fights, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. They said he'd had 75 pro fights, but that means he's probably had about 200. Right. Uh, they, they told us 75. What In reality, it'd have been a lot, lot more. So, yeah, I was on part. I got added to the to the England team. It was England versus Thailand. All the best fighters from England were all fighting all the... Well, not the best fighters from Thailand, but fighting a strong team from Thailand. And all the best English fighters, they all got obliterated. And I was the only one who, who won who from the, the top fights. Um, I got dropped for the first time in that fight as well. I got hit with a head kick in round four. So that was the first time I had to like, I'd won most of my other fights pretty easily. I'd knocked most of them out or battered them convincingly. So this was the first time I'd been thrown in there and had a bit of a adversity against me when I fought and I had to show what I was made of and I had to show that I'm not just like a flash in the pan who was just knocking these guys out. I had to show that when it does get put on me and I'm thrown into the, the pressure cooker, I could I could handle it. And I did. I, I got knocked down in round four of a massive head kick and I got back up and then I knocked him out in round five. Yeah. So what about the first defeat then? How did, how did that come about? <sighs> I'd had 29 pro fights and I fought um, a Thai called Duao, uh, Congo Dom. I'd fought and quite a few Thai fighters by this time. I'd, I'd knocked most of them out, beat a few on points. But this was the first, they were good fighters. This was the first time I'd fought an elite fighter who was a stadium champion and fighting at the highest level in Thailand. He was he was one of the best in the world. The fight before me, he beat the guy who was pound for pound number one in Thailand at that time. Wow. And I didn't realise this at the time because I was just thinking, well, it's the same as anyone else, get in there and I'll, I'll put him away. So we fought and then in round two, I went bang, left hook. Knocked him down. I thought, oh, there we go. See, it's going to be the same as everyone else. And he jumped up. He looked across the ring at me. He didn't have a gum shield in. He had blood all over his teeth. And he smiled at me. He went, uh -huh. And I thought, hmm, that was a bit weird. They usually stay down That's when I hear them. Yeah. yeah, they usually stay down. And honestly, so the bell went. He went back to his corner, went back to mine. And then round three, four, and five, he beat me within an inch of my life. Like, I, I don't think many people would have, like, Battered an eyelid of fight in midway through round four. He was battering me that bad. If he if did knock me down, then I'd have stayed down. I was getting beat that bad. It was it, it was, it was severe beating, to be fair. But the goal that was going through my head is you made your bed, you lay in it, you take your beating like a man. And then after the fight, it, were, it was just playing on my mind just how badly I got battered them last three rounds. And I'm thinking, Phew. I've got two options here. I can stick around fighting these mediocre or good level fighters and fighting all these Europeans and get a few decent ties flown into England for me and, and beat them and just keep padding out my record or how do I how do I compete with these guys? I thought I've only had 30 fights here. They've all had 150. I said I need to I need to catch up to them. So it was just playing on my mind over and over and I had two options. Either do that I just said about padding out my record or go to Thailand and train how they train, fight how they fight, add that to my style and go fight against them out, out there and try and level up my game to, to that point. So... I didn't want to just be like an average fighter. I wanted to get to the top, so that were it. The fight were in November. Three weeks later, I finished with my girlfriend who I'd been with for three years. I said, I'm off to live in Thailand. I said, I can't. I need to, I need to go. I finished it with her. 
said to my mum, it was nearly Christmas, I said, I'm off Tyler, I'm on my cart cope with what's going on in my head. I said, I need to go out there and do this. And my mum was fuming because it was Christmas coming up, but I had, I needed uh, to put it right. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you've got you've got Thailand, how long do you end up staying in Thailand for? So, around two and a half years. So, I did, I would, what I'd do is I'd go for six months, get as many fights in as possible, train every day, train really hard, come home for a month to rest, go back six months, come on for a month, go back. I kept doing it like that. Just because just you, you, it's unsustainable to train and fight how they do because you pick up injuries. It's The the, the training is just so intense. You're fighting that regular and, and stuff like that. So it were unsust- well, for me, it were unsustainable because my body just wasn't used to it, which is also why a lot of the ties, they retired into the mid-20s. They get to 25. They burn out. And they've just, yeah, they've had enough. Yeah. They're sick yeah. to death of being put through the mill like they, they do. So obviously, like you're in bad company. You're surrounded by great champions anyway so so what did going to thailand give you that was extra to being surrounded by these guys so i went to a gym called jitty gym and at the time it had a lot of high level fighters there who were like stadium ranked in thailand so they were fighting in the main stadiums which is the 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 mecca of muay thai the stadiums in bangkok and a lot of elite level trainers who were like former champions themselves so like in bad company we've got all these great fighters and stuff like that but we're having to like say because there's only richard who's running the gym We'd have to pad work each other and things like that. I'm going into this gym in Bangkok. There's like 10 pad, 10 pad men, all great trainers, all former champions, or there's knowledge everywhere. And you're soaking up little bits like a sponge from each of these guys and stuff like that. The power environment is so important, isn't it? Like who you surround yourself exactly. with. And like you say, I suppose to like totally just immerse yourself in that Thai gym culture, yeah. you know, uh, you have that sort of, sort of like singularity of focus and like you said, you become obsessed with what you're doing yeah. every single day. Well, I, I slept on a mattress in the gym for the first six months of living there. I was just on a mattress in the gym like the ties were doing and then it got to the point where they were doing my fucking head in. So I just had to get out of there and I moved into a little apartment next door. But uh, yeah, like when I, it was tough when I first got there. Like obviously I was decent and uh, the ties knew I was decent, but obviously they want to smack you down and into place so I had to just keep working hard and then earn their respect and like my, my fights level the level of my fights were slowly going up and I had some good level fights in the, in the main stadiums there and I, I fought a lot of like top level guys and over the space of that two and a half years I had some crazy experiences a lot of fights um some highs some lows and it was just like it was life experience as well as Muay Thai experience yeah yeah so I mean at the end of the day I suppose it's just essentially just going out of your comfort zone a little bit yeah you know like you say you could have stayed in Leeds and you could have been had a very good career in that but taking yourself out of that comfort zone is where you're really going to grow I was saying to James on the way here no one ever reached the top by staying in the comfort zone yeah so that that was the main thing that I had to do and I and it wasn't like I just put my foot in the shallow end I got fucking thrown in the deep end I was up every morning with the ties running I would, they were like taking it in turns when they were watching me train and I was exhausted and they jumping fresh to spar or clinch me and they just fucking beat me up. And they were basically bullying me at the at the start of it until I levelled up a little bit. Because like I say, I'd only had 30 fights. They've all had 150 plus. I were already behind and I just had to keep working and working. I had to do what I needed to do to catch up. And if that meant staying that extra hour after training and doing that little bit of extra work, that's what I did. I mean, you know, like you said, you have to take risks in if you want to be great at anything, you've got to take a risk, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Don't work out, you fly home. Yeah, at least you took your shot. Exactly. At least you, you took know. your shot. And there's all these pussies that sit, sit around and they'll they'll critique, like go on uh, Instagram or something like that and they'll talk shit about me. What shot have they taken? Do you know what I mean? They, they haven't done shit. They're, they're, they're comfortable sat in their armchairs like that out on their keyboard warriors while I'm out there living my dream. Do you know what I mean? So, 100%. So do you still go out there now? Yeah, yeah. Well, would you just short of training camps now? Or, yeah, yeah, I couldn't live there again. Obviously, like I don't think my fiance would be very happy if I did just up and leave there. Yeah. But um, yeah, I couldn't live there again because that lifestyle and that fighter lifestyle out there, fighting that regular and just, yeah, I couldn't do that again. I don't fight as regular now. I'm 36 and I fight probably three, four times a year now if I can. The money's a lot better. I was fighting 10 times a year back then. Like literally fight a week off, fight a week off. It would just, when you're in Thailand. You yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in 2007, I had, that was probably my, my, one of my best years as a fighter. I had 10 fights, eight wins, one draw, one loss. I got recognized as one of the best foreign fighters in Thailand by their top magazine out there, which were, were massive for me at the time. Um, I beat three elite level t- Thai champions. I knocked all three of them out and stopped all of them which was unheard of at the time. Not many people from the Western world were doing anything like that. 
so that were that were massive for me and that were all to do with like just my time that I'd spent out there I think I went at the end of 2005 and then by 2007 so 2005 that elite guy battered me by 2007 I'd knocked three of them out on the bounce so that's how much I'd leveled up in that short space of time. So the the tie, as I said, the tie fights seem to have so many fights, but you were doing ten fights a year. Were they doing more still? Were they literally at it every weekend? Or so they're doing ten fights a year from being six years old. Okay, so oh, yeah. that's how they they've got so many. I remember when I had my hundredth fight, it were against it were a big thing in England. I don't think anyone else had done it at the time. I it were against a tie called Singdam, and the, and they interviewed us both before the fight, and they said oh, to him. Oh, this is Liam's 100th fight. That's a lot for a Westerner. What do you think of that? And he went, I'd had 100 fights when I was 15. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, man, come on. No, yeah. Not like making <laughs> yeah. me feel like a piece of shit, is it? Do you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, that's just how that is for them. Because a lot of it, it's not choice. They get sent off to train and fight to earn money from the families and then they get to a good level and all that. They earn money. They win a fight, get sent back to the family. They're in the gym. They do it again. Send it back. Send it back. And a lot of them put money into, like the elite level guys, I know a lot of them build farms and buy land. And so when they retire, they've got their own place. Do you know what I mean? A lot of them, get a, I know of a lot of top level guys, especially from the golden era back in the day, like they've got sucked into like drinking and they ain't got a pot to piss in now. Because even though they're the best level, they earn a lot of money and have just pissed it all away and stuff. But what happens to a lot of them ties, like I say, when they get to the mid twenties, they've lived like a monk and been running to the ground so much. They're like rebelling. You think, oh, fuck this. And then a lot of them end up drinking and stuff just because they've been run through the mill so much. Yeah, yeah. So when, when you was out there, were you having to rely on uh, fighting for money to survive out there or did you go out there with some savings and just able to focus on I, the training I took a little bit of savings with me but like I say it wasn't like a, it, I didn't think it through it was like a split last minute decision so I didn't have time to save much money I had a fight and then went fuck this I'm off so then when I got there and I realised I didn't have much money I thought probably should have just stayed in England maybe another couple of months to save some money but you know what that's what spurred me to keep fighting so regular I needed the money um, I told a story on Joe Rogan podcast, like I was fighting, it was a big fight in the stadiums and the stadium Muay Thai is run by gamblers. Gambling is massive out there. Gambling's illegal in Thailand, only in Muay Thai stadiums. So you can b gamble in the stadiums, you can't gamble anywhere else. So I went, it was a rematch. This guy had beat me on points previously. I'd thought I'd won the first fight, but they'd give it to him, but they, that were neither here or there. So I bet all my money that I had on myself that I was going to win. I bet my fight purse, I bet everything. I left myself about a thousand baht, which is about 20 quid, just, just in case. But I was so sure I was going to win, I'd bet everything. Or everyone in the gym had all bet on me. And in round three, I nearly knocked him out. And then he, he, round four, he picked up a few points. And round four, he just picked up a few points. And he just beat me by one point. Like, I think it was 48, 49 on scorecards. And I should have knocked him out in round three, but I... I don't know why I had a god knows just one of them nights where I just I could just couldn't just pull it off so I've got out of the ring I'm fucked it were a tough five round fight I think fuck I ain't got no money here so G, like the gym owner he did talk to me all night because he'd lost a lot of money betting on me as well and he comes up to me the next day and we're in gym and he went you ain't got no money left have you I went no <laughs> he went what are you going to do are you going home I went no he went good I'll organise you a fight in three days so I was fucked. I, I, did, I couldn't train again. So I, I just had to go jogging just to keep my weight down a little bit. I jumped on the plane, went to Phuket, to one of the islands, and I fought again three days later. Um, that was one of the worst experiences in my life, but I knew I had to win, and I knew I had to get the money. And I did. I went down, and I won by knockout in round three. Luckily for me, though, when you go down to the islands, like the fighters aren't as strong as in Bangkok. The good fighters, don't get me wrong, but it's coming back to what I was saying before about good fighters and elite fighters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I won. I won the fight, got some money, went back to Bangkok, and then carried on. But yeah, that were again, it's life experience, and it were it were a good experience, and I, I wouldn't change any of it for the world. But it wasn't nice. How, how long does it normally take you to recover from a tough fight like that before you can start training properly again? <sighs> You're looking at just, I'd like to have a week just off resting, letting everything, like my shins here, my body here, like making weights tough and you just want to let everything, Gosh, you yeah. know about that, fucking stripping weight down, mate. Yeah, it's not a nice yeah. experience to go through. So I just wanted to let everything come back to normal and just relax a little bit. And then going through a five round war, it is mentally challenging. Three days later thinking, fuck me, I've got to do that again. That was the toughest part. Like, my body's fucked. Yeah, fair dues. But do you know what I mean? My body will heal itself. But I was like thinking, right, come on, you've got to do this again. Well, I mean, obviously, you do have to be really mentally strong 
to, to be fighting, like to, like I said, to stay focused within that fight. And when you're getting the, everything thrown at you, you've got to be really focused. And like, where does your, your mental toughness come from? I don't know. I've just always, I don't know. Maybe it's from my dad. My dad were a bit of an hard geezer when he were, were a fiend. And um, I've just always had that in me, really. It's just the, how obsessed I've been with the sport and wanting to succeed in it. It's just like a little bit of pain or get hurt a little bit or take a bit of damage or succeed and live and live out my dream. Do you know what I mean? It's is the juice worth the squeeze always, yes, of course, because of the the end goal. Um so if you have to take a bit of damage and you have to drag yourself off the floor sometimes, if then for fair dues, that's what's just it's like chess with pain, that's what I say a lot of the time. Is it's just a game, it's just a sport. It's, there's no malice, there's no thingy. It's just in this game and you happen to get hurt a little bit. Um, and that's just part and parcel of it. And if you, you can't accept that as a fighter, you're going to get hurt. You're in the wrong sport. Yeah. Yeah. So like you, you have to make a de- deal with yourself. And I've done this before. I mean, you've got to make a deal with yourself. You look in the mirror and you say, listen, you've got to, this is what's going to happen. And that's that. You're going to get tired. You're going to be out of breath. You're going to be gasping for air. You're going to get hurt. But do you want to win? Yeah. It's as simple as that. And stuff like that, that, that sort of like positive self-talk and that, that stuff you can do to improve your, your yeah. mindset or improve that mental toughness a little bit. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, I've done stuff before where I've worked with a mind coach. I've worked with Vinny Shawman and stuff like that. Which, that were a good experience. So this is the guy who was on Joe Rogan. Yeah, that yeah. Vinny. He's one of my best friends and he has been for many years. Um, and he's a really successful mind coach. Worked with a lot of top-level guys, Thai boxers, a lot of guys in UFCs, pro boxers. Um, he works with a lot of top-level athletes. But So, yeah, that's like, you can do things like that, but... I think just like you said, if you when you, you can take yourself out of your comfort zone and like when I was that young fighting people that old and stuff like that, I always just added my self belief. I always just always there. We like some people who I've seen people they'll be amazing in the gym, they'll batter everyone in the gym and then I've watched them as they head into the ring to fight, deflate and lose it already in the head. Yeah. So if you're not mentally strong, it doesn't matter how physically strong you are, how good you look in the gym, none of it means shit because if you're not as strong mentally as you are physically, then it's not, not going to get anywhere. My name is Colin Wiseman. I'm on week 11 of the Mass Formation program with Stuart Garrington. Being tough, but it's a, the good type of tough that when you, you realise all your mistakes for the previous year of eating too much and drinking too much. I'd just say whatever your goals are, it gets you there. I set out with this as a 12 week program, and like I say, I plateaued for 10 months, and within three weeks, I beat my expectations. I've had to have surgery during the program, but we've not changed anything. We've just changed the programming slightly. It's been great all the way through it, so yeah, I'd recommend it. 100%. It's one of these things, I think, if you give it a chance and have a bit of self-discipline, I'm into the fifth week now and I literally feel the best I have done in, like, in years, to be honest. So why did you feel the need to work with Vinny to improve your level of mental toughness? Was something that kind of went wrong or was the... Yeah, the, I had a fight against a Thai fighter called Anawat. He was... He had this, I think, 75% knockout ratio called the Iron Hands of Siam. He was one of the best pound-for-pound pound fighters around at the time. Knock, knocked out most most of the best names. He knocked them clean out. I, I went to Jamaica to fight him. I went over there and I don't know. I was just, we ended up fighting at like three in the morning and it was just all a big fuck up and I ended up losing. I got smashed to bits and it was the first time I'd ever been stopped. I got stopped in round three and I'm thinking, wow, I didn't, they never saw that coming. I thought I were invincible. Do you know what I mean? If I ever got knocked down, I'd get back up and I'd carry on. And uh, that were that were, I knew Vinny were at the time a mind coach, and he'd said to me in, before, "Do you want to do a bit?" And I'd go, "No, I don't need it. I'm all right." And then after the fight, I'm thinking, "I know I can beat this guy. There's so much just want right there. I don't know what it was. It was just an off night. I know I can beat him." So I begged and begged and begged for a rematch. And I knew there were a big show coming up in England. I said, "Please get me out of what." So they, I think about five, six months later, they brought him to England and we fought at the MEN Arena. It was the biggest Thai boxing show England had ever seen and I was the main event against Nanawa. So Vinny said, do you want to do a bit? I went, do you know what? I'm going to be in the best shape physically. I may as well make sure my mind's bulletproof as well. And we did some work in that fight and uh, yeah, it were hard to describe what he does because it'll be different for everyone, but he put a few key words in my head. He'd hypnotise me and stuff like that, which I didn't believe in. But he said, it's a real thing. He has to, he did it to me. And I won the fight convincingly. I mean, everything that's, that I hit me with bounced off me. 
He hit me with a left hook in round four that would have knocked 99% of fighters out. I won on points. Biggest win in my career. I went to the after party. I flaked out, passed out, got took to hospital because I had such a bad concussion. I had to stay in overnight and I had to monitor me overnight. Worst concussion I've ever had. But that's how hard he hit me in round four and it just bounced off me because my mind was bulletproof. Um, so yeah, if, like one of the best things I did working for Vinny with, with that fight and the stuff he instilled in me, it's still in me now, I believe. I was going to say, so is it something that you'd done since that fight, if it works so well, or is it just can he just use them tactics and techniques that he, he showed you in future fights? Yeah, I've done it a few times with him. Uh, I don't do it every fight, but just no. a few times I've done it with him, uh, just like a bit of a, a top-up. Uh, I know a lot of top-level guys who've worked with him and they've gone on to win some massive, massive fights and they've, they've thanked him for that. So, yeah, he's, he's a really he's a good friend to have on side and it's a good tool to have. He's crazy. Like, you know, I mean, uh, you probably spoke to, to James and we did a Tony Robbins event. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we did that business mastery with him and um, there was, I think, Ty, he was working with Tiger Woods and he'd not won like a, a major for 11 years. So obviously had that thing where he crashed his golf yeah, cart and yeah. he's the, the whole deal with his wife and stuff like this. And he just completely, he was done. And he started working with Tony Robbins and just on the mindset side Turned of things, around. goes wins another yeah. Masters. 11 years later, after everyone thinks he's done. The know? most powerful weapon 100%. by a mile. 100%. Mm. Yeah. So, um, Talk then about like the, the the mental cues and stuff like that that he that he that he gave you. What about like that pre-fight ritual? Do you have like a pre-fight ritual? And obviously you've got like the the white crew. Is it uh, the, the the dance and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, I, I haven't done that like for a, quite a while. That one, it, like, it, I did that a lot when you were living in Thailand and stuff like that. They've tried to fade it out a little bit now because they want it more westernized. They want straight in the ring. You don't want you waiting around. They don't want the music on. They want you straight action. So the, the fans aren't getting no. Uh, Waiting for yeah. what's going on here because if you don't know what that is, you don't know. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I mean? yeah. So, but did, did you have like did, did that kind of like put you in a, a zone for it? Or was that like a distraction from it? Do you have your own um, sort of like pre-fight ritual? Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I quite enjoyed doing the the Y crew because I had my own little one that I'd like one at Ty show me and stuff. I quite enjoyed doing it, and it was nice to just get in the ring instead of going straight up and you go straight face to face. Point, you get in and you 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 get your surroundings. You walk around the ring to seal it and stuff like that. So you get used to just being in the ring and you're at ease, and then. Then you fight, yeah. It was quite a nice thing to do. Like I said, I don't do it anymore, like because it's getting faded out. But they don't do that in the one. No, 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 in no, one. No, no. it's no. really like they want action in one. They don't want people waiting around and stuff. You get in, you fight, you get out, you get yeah. next person in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, that's with the MMA gloves as well and stuff. So it's a little bit Got, different. Yeah, it's not yeah. traditional Muay Thai. Got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, how does your mindset change from like you know when you are climbing that hill? You're not won a world title and you're you're, you're hungry for everything. To when you've been a multiple time world champion and now essentially you're the guy to beat in a lot of situations is there much of a mindset difference when you're going into to, to fights I, not really i mean i love i just love fighting I'll, it's it's part of who i am and every time you win a fight it's a, it's a buzz it's it's a it's a it, winning's a drug that nothing else can compare to i love the, just the rush and i love just everything about it from the build-up to the fight to the ring walk to you get in and you're face to face with your opponent and then you're throwing down and kick punching knee and elbowing with some of the best fighters in the world. Everything about that is just a buzz. Um, so yeah, I'll, and I will hold on to that for as long as I can. I'll ride it till the wheels fall off. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be one of them guys who goes past the best and past the cell by, by the day and losing fights that I should win and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? But I will keep doing, I, I love what I love what I do. Yeah. So my mindset hasn't changed. I, every fight's just the fight to me and every fight's the same goal. I want to entertain the fans. Make sure it's a good fight and just enjoy myself. Do you feel a different level of pressure now that you are obviously eight-time world champion and that you are who you are in the sport? Uh, sort of like a level of expectation. Yeah, it is. Uh, Does that affect you at all? Or? If, no, not really, because I always think, you know what I mean? There's always pressure. There's there's pressure you've got to perform for all your fans. You've got to perform for your country because obviously I'm always fighting and representing England. You've There's always the haters who are waiting to see you fail, but they they don't bother me because I just think, you know what, fuck them. They haven't done what I've done and they can't do what I do, do you know what I mean? They they could never get themselves into the position that I've got myself into. So that doesn't bother me too much. Um, But yeah, they always had a little bit of added pressure, but it's just part of it. It's part part of any sport. It's like any any sport, there's always a bit of pressure on you. I think if you don't put a little bit of pressure on yourself and give yourself that little bit of an extra push, then you're not normal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about mental toughness there. The fight before your last last one, uh, Mung Tai. Yeah, they fought, yeah, yeah. That was an unreal example of mental toughness. Yeah. Like, so if, if anyone's not seen this, right, you need to put it on YouTube. Um, you were put down with a head kick. 
you got back up three seconds later, you put down with a, a left hook, I think it was. Yeah. And in Thai, in Thai boxing, three knockdowns in a round and round it's game three, over, right? Yeah. So, you know, at that point when you've been put down twice, what's going through your head right now? Because you must have been rocking, you must have been hurting at that point. I just kept thinking, all I need is one one gap. Get back up, all you need is one gap. That's the reason why you don't ever quit at anything in life because when it gets tough and if you persevere, that's usually when a little bit of magic happens and that's what happened in that fight. He came in to finish me off and knock me down for that last time and I was still, although I'd been knocked down twice, my legs weren't gone and my eyes were still clear and I was thinking, give me one gap and he left me a gap. And if, Was he just getting too excited thinking? Yeah, he left a massive gap and he gave me that gap and I let a right hand go and it knocked him down and then I knocked him down two more times. And everyone That's was crazy. saying it was the, the craziest round in combat sport history. Five knockdowns in 90 seconds. Um, but yeah, we're like, that, I loved that. I'm Explain not, that I, feeling, mate, because that must have been like from, you know, even though you were still like, you know, give me that gap, I'm going to take it. You knew you'd just been sat on your ass twice. Yeah, and yeah. like to come back in such a short period of time, it's not like you had a, a break for the round, then you went back again and you ended up with it. It was it was over like that, wasn't it? It was, like you said, 80, 90 seconds, whatever it was, five knockdowns and the fight's over. Yeah. Like, explain that feeling, mate. That was an like unbelievable comeback. We, I, I, you know what? It was hard. I, I, I remember when I got out there. So after the fight, I did my pre-fight, my post-fight interview. The boss gave me a 100,000 bonus. And I was like, holy shit, amazing. Thank you very much. What was that, like a fight of the night bonus? Just, or just yeah, a win? Yeah, yeah. yeah, but the, one championship do like big bonuses. So up to five fighters on each show can win a 50 grand bonus. But he gave me a double bonus. He's just said 100 grand, um, unbelievable. Um, so I got out of the ring and I thought I'd brought my hand because my hand was smashed after the fight. So I went out, the doctor took my gloves off, threw me straight in the back of an ambulance. I'm off straight, I'm in the back in an ambulance. And I'm just sat there with my coaches and we're looking at each other in the back of the ambulance going, what the fuck just happened then? I'm going, and we kept looking at each other and going, what the fuck? And like none of us could believe what had happened. I went, did I just get 100 grand then as well? I'm like, what is going on here? Uh, have you ever had a more mental fight than that in your life? I've had some crazy ones throughout my years because of my style. Is that, that, That's how I just like to fight. It's like stand and bang. But that, I don't think that, that'll be take some beating, not just from me, just from any, anyone in any combat sport ever because they were insane. Um, but like I say, that's what I like. That's why my last fight I was so gutted that when my knee going so early that I didn't get the chance to to show some of that fire and some of that craziness that that I love that's what I love yeah, yeah. I live for that shit so 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 talk us through like um, your training camp for a fight how long does that normally last for so when I was younger and I was fighting so so like often that I'd, I'd be, I'd maybe three or four weeks have a fight okay. have a week off three or four weeks have a fight have a week off now Obviously, there's more. I'm older. I need to watch injuries. I need to like. Obviously, there's more like sport specific ways to train S and C and getting a full fight fit program and stuff. So now I'm looking at nine, ten weeks. Um, and then obviously there'll be my S and C. I'll train boxing. I'll train Muay Thai. I'll try and fit a little bit of everything in. And is I don't run anymore. Um, I've took that out because I realised it's absolutely pointless. I don't. I don't know why I used to run so much. It was just like a fight thing we got told we needed to run so we did it I've re- I haven't run for about four years so I've realised you, you don't need to run whatsoever just bring it down more sport specific when are you fight in a ring you're fighting bursts so it's like bam 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 and then you'll breathe and you'll rest and you'll look and bam 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 you'll go again a run is like steady for like 40-50 minutes you don't fight like that so I do stuff now that I'll do maybe get me on the walk bike and I'll do a 20 second sprint or the skier 20 seconds flat out breathe for 10 seconds 20 seconds flat out and those sport specific stuff yeah, like yeah, that all that uh, that awful bit of kit that assault bike yeah, thing that's yeah. the worst thing in history that but yeah stuff like that 20 second bursts on there 10 times and stuff like that I think they're a lot more sport specific now we, we did that I do the uh, strength conditioning at the uh, York Econ Rugby Club Yeah. and before I got there they were doing the same things the big road runs and, yeah. and all this sort of stuff and it was like when we actually look at the game it's played, you know, you'd normally play between 10 and 20 metres and all like very super short bursts, exactly. you know so what I mean? So sprints. everything we do yeah. is in within like a 10, 20 metre grid exactly. or it's for no longer than about eight seconds and that's it, you know, like yeah. intense because that's so much more transferable to the game. Exactly. And like you say, I think- but the thing is, when I was first coming up and when I was fighting when I was younger, there were none of this. I wish when I were like, I look at the fighters nowadays and like the 19, 20 year old, 
21, 22, and you look at them and they're all in fucking, they're ripped and they're muscly and because they're all doing S&C two or three times a week, there were none of that. He would just kick pads, spa, kick the bag. I look like a fucking bag of soup when I was fighting when I was 19, do you know what I mean? I had no muscles or all like that. And that's just how it was back then. Like, But night now there's all this sports science and everything's all fought out and stuff. So these kids now that are coming up, they're all fucking absolute beasts. And like they're all, they all look like they've been built, you know, grown in a greenhouse or something. They're all absolutely jacked. So yeah, like, I, I wish I'd have had that coming up, but like there were none of that. Even like the Thais in Thailand, they didn't have that until recently. They're getting onto it now, which is making them more more dangerous as well, which obviously they're already up, up there as yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. So when they're adding that to the game and stuff. But yeah, I wish I'd have had that when I was coming through the ranks. But What about the nutrition side of things? Do you, you, you have much help with that or is it just kind I of I only just... brought a nutrition in to my last fight and I thought, oh, you know what, it's a big fight. I might as well get one on board. I've... I know how to make weight. I've fought professionally nearly 120 times, so and I know what I'm doing. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to work with this guy. I work with him called Pete from Conditioning Nutrition. Best thing I ever did. I thought, why the fuck didn't I do this years ago? You feel better, like you can perform yeah, better. Yeah, you just energised. Yeah. Like, my training felt better. Um, I was eating things I didn't know I could eat. I was eating at times I didn't think I could eat at and stuff like that. And you don't realise, do you, until like it, everything I did were trial and error. And it was just like, I thought, oh, this works. I'll do this. And we're like, no, you don't want to be doing that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it was just nice to get a, There's a, better way a professional yeah. point of view on it from him. So yeah. 100%. So what would a, a daily routine look like for you in a, in a fight camp? So about 10 years ago, when I, or maybe 15 years ago, when I'm living in Thailand, it would be, you get up seven in the morning, 10K run, come back, hit the pads, hit the bag for a couple of rounds, maybe a bit of light clinch work, go sleep and I'll eat and then sleep a little bit in the afternoon then up three o'clock till six o'clock, three hours, either do a run for 30 minutes or skip for 30 minutes to warm up. Then you're on the pads, seven, eight rounds on the pads. Then you're sparring, then you clinch work and that's a bit of conditioning work afterwards. So that's how that'll be just every day like that. So no wonder all these tides that were getting like doing that for years and years, like the knees were fucked from running all that stupid amount in the morning every day. What's that, about six hours a day then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was just a long time. It's just, it's just realised that it should, yeah, it's, do you know what I mean? Obviously it's worked for them, but it's repetitive, repetitive. And the, the toll it takes on your body is, it's massive. And these days what it'll look like is like, it, my, my training's all over. So on a Monday, I'll do S&C in the morning, early morning. Afternoon, I'll go to the early afternoon, I'll go 11, 12-ish, I'll go to the gym, I'll hit pads, come back at the night, I'll hit pads again, then sparring or something like that, or clinch work. The next day, I'll have a bit of an easier day, I'll do just sharp pad work, fast pad work, maybe a bit of bag work, then I'll go do my boxing training, and then Wednesday, Thursday, it'll be similar, pad work, sparring, Friday, there'll be more um, S&C again. And then it's just doing it like that. And you, obviously you've got to make sure that when you're doing your SNC, you don't want to be like too tired and stuff like that because you're not going to get anything out of it if your body's too fucked from it. So it's just trying to find like the right times. And again, that will trial and error a bit for a, a little bit of time. Like you'll, you'll know yourself in your game. Obviously, if you're like lifting heavy weights and trying to do explosive lifts and stuff like that, if you're so fucked from doing pads too close to it or something, it's going to be pointless because you're not going to get anything out of it. Yeah, you've got to prioritise rest and recovery as well, aren't you? Yeah, for, exactly. To, to, like say, peak performance, which you're after here. So... Um, Obviously, that's like for what the four or six weeks before a fight. That's the sort of schedule that you're running. What about outside of that time? Like, say you're down to just a couple of fights a year now, two or three fights a year, something like that. So, like, how does your training look outside of those camp times? It's the same sort of thing, but just. I will still do my S and C twice a week because yeah. it's just so good, just for like injury maintenance and stuff like that. Like, obviously, if you don't start doing that, then. If you're doing just S&C just for a 10-week fight camp, you'll go up there, and if you just stop for a month or whatever, you're going back down there, and it's just going to be like that all the time. But if you can maintain yourself at a good level all the time, so the next fight camp, I go, whoop, whoop. And like I can do that. I'm getting stronger and stronger. Even though I'm 36, I'm still getting stronger now yeah. than I ever have been. Um, I'll still do my S&C twice a week. I'll still hit pads two or three times a week to keep ticking over. Uh, like I said, I don't run anymore, but I'll still be on my walk bike or doing like a conditioning session once or twice a week just to keep my fitness up, keep my weight down. So I, st I love training. It's not like I'm doing it just because I enjoy fighting. I love training no matter whether it's a conditioning session or whatever. Like yesterday I went to my S&C coach and we did 500 meter ski, 100 kettlebell swings, 500 battle ropes, 300 sit-ups, 500 meter ski again, just because just, I like doing, putting my body like, you know, pushing myself and I love training. 
Um, I didn't have to do it. I'm, I'm injured at the minute. But I said, right, give me something I can do to work around this injury so I don't have to hurt, hurt myself. But I still need to feel like I'm putting the work yeah. in. Do you know what I mean? It's, again, it's a mental thing. If I don't feel like I'm putting the work in, I don't like that. I, I get a bit depressed. Um, and I struggle with my fucking mental health, like in lockdown and stuff like that. Because my head fully went when we were in lockdown. And I was just sat in that house all the time, just sat depressed and not being able to go to gyms and stuff like that and thinking my fight career were over. So I don't ever want to get back to how bad I was then because that was fucking horrendous and I don't want my, my fiancé to have to put up with that again. So like, if I don't get to train regular, like that, even when I'm injured, I will find something I can do. Like story, when my knee yeah. first went, I went and just sat on a box and just went and sat on that ski erg for about fucking an hour, just sat there pulling it. Like, Didn't you get bored? I went, yeah, I'm bored out of my mind, but I needed to do something. Absolutely, yeah. So you still have a level of discipline even in the like non-camp weeks then. Yeah, well, even when I retire, I won't ever give up training. I love it. Yeah, so I yeah. love it too much. I'll yeah. still hit pads. I'll still spar. Um, I'll still do my S and C. I'll still. I, I love training. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what about like nutrition? Do you kind of just like not take as much <laughs> notice of that in the? Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the worst. You'll know how hard it is to make weight and maintain. Obviously, you, we strip weight and then we'll balloon and that. When your game, I'm guessing you had to be fucking pretty strict all year round. Yeah, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna be at a top level of bodybuilding, yeah. you've got to your off season's got to be as important as that of course, prep season. Yeah. You know, like a, a lot of people make the mistake of just like piling so many calories in and binge eating in the offseason. I can do what I want. It's off season. But that's actually the time that you're building muscle. Yeah. And that's the time that you're actually growing. Yeah. So you've got to take it as as care as you know as strictly as what you would with a, a prep seat. Prep Rick theory. Waller's spirit lives inside of me, <laughs> mate. I'm telling you, honestly, I, I can't I, it's like sometimes like I did it the other day. It's like I just black out and I turn around, I've eaten a full pizza and chips and I think then I hate myself. And then the next day, I'll think, right, I've got to fucking train harder now. And I, I, sometimes I do shit like that. Like, I can maintain most of the time, and then I'll just have an horrible, big, awful binge. And then I'll hate myself after it, though, so it'll make me... But you, you it, see fighters, I mean, obviously boxers, like, but, like, the Ricky Attens, the Nazim Ahmeds, binge. and stuff like that. Do they you know binge, what I mean? yeah. yeah. They go, that must be... I mean, again, it's, it's real tough on the body to, to do that, so... Like, you say, you're that, you're that strict for 10, 12 weeks in the build-up to a fight, and you've lived like a monk. I mean, if you don't have an outlet some somewhere for it, some people's drink, some's a drug, some's food. If you don't have some sort of outlet somewhere, you'll go insane, Cost, I think. yeah, yeah. No, no, you're exactly right, yeah. you're exactly right. So, um, so let's go through... Um, and still quite your world titles, eight world titles. Talk me through that first win, mate. Like, how did that feel? Because the I, first I, world title, yeah, the first one. Because I think that's the one where you go, like, no matter what happens from this point on, I've been a world world champion. Yeah. So I think I was eighteen, and it were in Italy, and it were under kickboxing rules, and I went over there and I fought one of their local guys, and I remember it. So this is fucking ridiculous, actually. And when I think back about how fucking ridiculous and how bad they try, whenever you go abroad around Europe, they will try and stitch you up. We're too fair when fighters come over to England. We are the only nation who will give them a fair shake in the judging, who won't try fucking stitch them up any other way. You go to Italy, you go to France. I've heard some horrendous stories from them places. I've had some done to me myself, so I've seen it firsthand. This is one of them. So I went over there, only 18. My mum and dad came over. I went with Richard and Lisa. Got to the weigh-in. I'd only taken the fight on three weeks' notice, so it was, I had to strip the weight off. I flew in a sweatsuit. I wrapped up in a sweatsuit, so I'm sweating on the plane. Got there to the weigh-in. All the TV cameras in Italy were there. Stripped off, dried off, got on. The fight weight was 62.3. Or it 61.2. Yeah, I think, yeah, 61.2, lightweight. Got on, bang on, 61.2 on the scales. Perfect. They went, oh, well done, go eat. I went, where's my opponent? They went, oh, he's... He's coming from Naples or he's coming from somewhere else, so he's, uh, he's a bit far away. He'll be here soon, though. I went away. I drank three litres of water straight away, as you do, getting all fluids back into me. Uh, I went and ate loads of pasta. We're in this Italian restaurant, so they started bringing pizza and steak out, and I, I had no idea about nutrition back then either, and I'm fucking just stubbing all sorts of myself, eating all that. Even I did dessert, drank more water. So then they went, oh, your opponent's here now. Come back. So I went back and they've changed scales. They'd gone from being proper digital ones to them no ones with with thing on. Yeah. And what the fuck are they? I said, get the proper scales back. And they went, oh no, you broke them. I said, I'm nine stone, you dickhead. I said, I haven't broke anything. I said, get them scales back. I have not broke anything. That no, they broke after you got on them. So he gets on them and he's 63.5. And I went, 
No, it's a world title. You have to be on title weight. He gets to 61.2. I'm like, no, no, no. Oh, camera's here. You've got to pretend he's med weight. It'll look bad for TV. I went, I don't give a fuck. I said, get him on the scales. I went, all right, when you get back on the scales, I went, I've just gorged myself. I thought, I'm going to be about 68 kilos here. I've, I've had about four litres of water, a big meal. And you know what it's like when you strip, when you eat and stuff, your body holds onto yeah, it and you yeah. retain a bit of water. So I thought, I'm going to be about 67 here. So I've got back on, I'm only 63 kilo. Bear in mind, I had about five litres of water. That's five kilo right there. Eating a big free course meal and stuff like that. I'd not been at the toilet or anything. And I'd only put on two kilo. So I thought, hang on a minute. If he's just turned up, he's meant to be 61. It means he must be about 67 kilo here. So he's missed weight massively. But I was so mad. I just went, fuck it. I don't care. I couldn't give a fuck. And then I went back to the hotel last night, uh, the night, and I thought, oh, what have I done here? I thought he, and when we got in the ring the next day, mate, he was massive compared to me. And I remember look, when the referee brought us to the centre of the ring and I'm, I was staring at him. I looked down and his legs were massive and his body were massive. I thought, fucking hell. And we came out round one and I remember he punched me and he hit me straight on the chin and my legs went and he wobbled me. And I sat back, went back to the corner, I sat down and I went, fucking hell. And Richard went, what? I went, that were, that were hard. And he went, this is how it is. He said, this is how it's going to be. He said, do you want the belt? I said, yeah, he went, go get it. And then I stopped him in round four. Um, I took some horrendous punishment in the in round two and three. But because he was such a heavy boxer, I just smashed his leg and smashed his leg. And then in round four, I stopped him with leg kicks and I'm running around ring celebrating and all fans are throwing bottles at me and everything. But I was loving it. I was only, like, I was only 18. I was loving it. I was running around ring going, come on. <laughs> it, it was just a, yeah, it was a mad experience. Um, but yeah, that's the, the level of, what they were trying to stitch you up like when you yeah. when you fight abroad. I yeah. remember one guy went to fight in France and he got the boat over and the promoter met him with some scales at the boat and the boat was, <laughs> there was stuff here and his weight wouldn't stay still. They went, nope, you're overweight. And they fined him some of his purse for it wow. and tried to make him lose weight. That's how crazy some of them not do it over there. Unreal. So do you have a, a title win that meant the most to you? Um... The WBC was, at the time, it's obviously it's a big one in boxing, WBC, the green belt. Uh, when I won that, I won it off the current champion. That were a, that were a good one to win just because it was just a WBC, the green belt. It's one, one of the best world titles we'll have and only the top, top guys at the time were were contesting it. So that were a good one. But probably I knocked out a, a Thai who were ranked number one in Thailand at the time. He came over to England to fight me. And we fought twice. The first fight, we fought in Leeds at the Leeds Town Hall. Everyone who I knew were there. I 100% won that fight and they give it to the tie. That's what I mean about the judges over here and that trying to be fair. There comes a bit time when it's a bit too fair. I don't know whether they just didn't like me or what. But they give it to the tie. Everyone in the, the, the arena started booing. Even the tie couldn't believe it. My Thai trainer who was over from Thailand with us in our corner, he, he, just, he couldn't believe it. And even the the Thai's manager came over and went, oh, you won that. We don't know what's happened. So then we had a rematch for his title again because he was the, the current world champion. Brought him to England again and I knocked him out this time. Because I said, to, I said, right, it's not going distance this time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to knock him out. And I did. I knocked him out in round four. So that was that a really good one. Yeah, the, that one the, probably. Any particular career highlights or you know moments that really stand out for you obviously I'm assuming that you know Mung Thai fight is, is probably right up there but and these world title wins but anything else that really kind of stands the, out for the you the Anawat one the Anawat story where I said I worked with Vinny and really yeah. rematch that were a good one that was my dad's birthday as well it was an MEN arena massive arena show biggest show in the country and to get absolutely smashed in the first fight and then come back and win in the rematch like in that style I think that were that was up where Mung Thai, obviously. Um, I've had, like I said, I've had 120 pro fights. There's just some of them that I forget about and they slip under radar and then think, ah, should have mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. There's been so many. There's been some lows as well, don't get me wrong, but there's been so many highlights that, uh, yeah, there's just some of them. Yeah. I, like, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head. Well, you, so obviously, you mentioned like, the good times and, and the highlights and certain, some like bad times as well. Like, what, What's the worst? Like, you have been on a really bad run of form and then a bit of a losing streak. Yeah, I had uh, I had four fights in a row that I lost. Two of them were under rules that I didn't fight under. Like, I took two kickboxing fights because um, the money were massive. Um, I hate kickboxing. I, I don't mind watching it. It's a tough sport. Some very tough guys involved in it. But I can say you can only be good at something if you love it. And I didn't enjoy it. Didn't enjoy the training. I was just doing it just for the money. Lost both of them. Came back to Thai boxing. And then my next two fights were both against elite Thai champions. One of them, Sanchai, the greatest fighter of the last 25 years. 
and then another one who'd just beaten Sanchai and I lost both of them. So then I'm sat there thinking, fuck me, I lost four in a row here. I'm, I'm, if, I lose, if I lose fifth in a row, I'm, I'm jacking it in. Uh, How do you get your mind straight after that then? Well, that were it. It's fucking, you've, you've got two options. Do you, do you lay down and just accept it or do you just fucking drag yourself up and then carry on? Like I said, like perseverance is the, the main thing in, in any walk of life. You have to persevere. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I've, I've got, I'm better than this. Obviously, I've, and then I started looking at it different. I thought, you know what, the two losses in kickboxing, didn't like the sport, didn't really care. The two losses in Muay Thai against two of the best fighters of this generation. It's not that bad. Get your shit together. So then I fought a real good European fighter in my next fight after this. Everyone was raving about him at the time because he was only young. He was only 20 years old, I think. He'd beaten a lot of good level ties and everyone was raving in the next big thing. And I just schooled him, like proper schooled him. He, he barely touched me and I just really beat him up easily. And then I thought, ah, that were a good win. I'm back up there now. Well, I think, especially in Thai boxing, losing is part of the sport, right? Do you know? That, yeah. I mean, does anybody there's go There's so many ways to lose in yeah. Thai boxing. Even Sanchai, the greatest fighter of this era, he's had 350 fights. He's lost 50. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's so many ways to, to lose in Thai yeah. boxing. Well, he's, he's, as well, so it's, it's, it's not about losing, it's about how you react mm. to losing, do you know? Of course, and yeah, yeah. You suppose you have to go back to controlling what you can. Um, you know, like you say, you can't, the them results have gone, yep. but you can you know, choose to affect your what your effort is, what how your training is, how your nutrition is, all that thing is going forward. And yep. I suppose that you have certain things that are in place every time that you're winning. Yeah. And it's a case of going back to those like non negotiables really, do you know? Yeah, of course. So so let's talk about injuries then, mate. Um obviously you sat there with the the busted knee right yeah. now, but uh, have you had many Many injuries through your career? I've been lucky. I haven't had too many bad ones. I've had a dislocated shoulder. I've done my AC joint in my shoulder, but they're, they're easy to bounce back from, to be fair. So I haven't been out for too long. I had a bad one in in China. I got my eye socket fractured. And I fought in China a few years ago against a tie. And I went to throw a big left hook in round one, and he timed it with an elbow, and it hit me straight on my eye. Massive cut under my eye. It knocked me down. I got back up. I didn't quit. I finished the fight. I lost on points because of the knockdown. And I got dragged straight out of the ring. I got cut horrendously twice. I got a um, big cut up on my head and that one where he fractured my eye socket right under my eye. You can probably see it scar under there now still. I got dragged out the ring. They took me outside and the, I still had my gloves on and everything. They pushed me out the fire door. They went, ambulance will come. Locked the fire door and we're in the middle of fucking Zhengzhou in China, which was about... God knows how hot it was. It was disgustingly hot. I was stood outside for an hour, mate. No, I just had an hard fight. I wanted a drink. I was sweating. I remember I had to hide under a tree to get away from the sun. And then someone, my trainer finally came and opened the fire door and went, what are you doing? I went, they've just fucking locked me outside. You're like, I've seen kickboxer where they just take him out and fucking throw him in the street. That's what it was like. I was like, they've just locked me outside. So I went back in and went to... Uh, to the doctor, they went, no, oh, you need to sort his face out. And then they went, I can't sort that out. So they took me to the hospital, I just gave me eye ache trade and then all that side. And then I was stitched up by a plastic surgeon. It was an absolute nightmare. So that was bad. I couldn't feel the left side of my face for about eight months. That, that were a oh. bad one. Um, yeah, probably that, that, that oh, mini awesome. injury were a bad, but I've, I've always found a way to, to get me sent back pretty quickly. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, how are you finding it now with, with the knee? I suppose, like, it must be worse having an injury and coming off the back of a loss. Yeah, because of course. Just that the frustration, to get back in there yeah, and, yeah. And, and start focusing on the next challenge, really. Like I say, you have to keep your mindset strong when shit like that happens. It's, and, it, that's, and that's tough because it is easy to just sit down and start feeling sorry for yourself and go down a slippery slope. But like I say, I'm not done yet. I've still got my next goal in my mind in place. And all you like, I can't work fully towards it. Everything I'm doing, boxing... SNC knee rehab is still working towards it one way or the other. So I'm just looking at it at that way at the minute. And I've still got goals in place and I'm still driven and motivated to to get another shot at that belt. Yeah, I was gonna say obviously a very, very driven guy. So like and, and with a, a crazy work ethic. Have you always had that sort of like first in, last out sort of mentality when it comes to training. Do you know what? I've, I've, I'm because I've got ADHD, I think I'm really good at zoning in on stuff that um interests me. And that I am obsessed with Thai boxing. So I, I literally, the first time I ever walked into the gym, that were it. My hyper focus was on and then I'm just, everything, I wanted to learn everything. I wanted to know all the Thai fighters. Everyone calls me Stato when I was younger, like, because I knew everything about every single Thai fighter, every fighter in England. I knew how many fights they had, how many they won, what, what the style was and stuff like that. Like I say, if I can focus in on something that I love and I'm lucky 
that I fell in love with Thai boxing and it has given me all these opportunities and it's given me this, the lifestyle I've had. And don't get me wrong, it's been tough and I was skint till I was 30, but I had life experience and everything that I'd done then has put me onto this second part of my life and it's, uh, yeah, and it's been amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously you said that next for you is potentially that fight in January. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so will that be another title shot or will that be, you no, have to have a couple of fights first Yeah, you I'm get guessing that title that I'll have to have back, a couple yeah. of fights first. I've mentioned a few opponents, but I'm just waiting for my manager and stuff to confirm him. I'm, I'm not sure, it'll be a couple of days. Um, will that be back out in Thailand? Bangkok. There's, Bangkok, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a big show in Bangkok. He's won championship again, so I'm hoping to be on that. Um, there's a few opponents who have been mentioned, but I like to say I'm, I'm not really too fussed. I just want to get back in there and yeah. right the wrongs. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, life after fighting, like you said, what you've got, how, how many, a couple of years left? Yeah, you, I believe so. I believe yeah. I've got a couple, couple of years there. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what does life after fighting look like? Well, I, I do a lot of seminars and stuff like that, and I'm, I've been smart about this because I've been doing my seminars since my mid twenties and building them up and building them up. So and they're all over the world, aren't they? So yeah, you're in America yeah. and stuff like. Yeah, I'm going everywhere. to America next month okay. um, to do a little seminar tour there around uh, California, then on to Texas and stuff like that. So that'll my seminars and I'll be coaching in the gym. I'll be doing stuff like that. So I'll, I'll be. I, it's going to be tough letting go of the fight side because it's been my life for so long. And like I say, it's a drug. That nothing else can compare to like um so chasing that high i'm gonna have to find something else to probably be on smack or something it'll be hard just try having to let that go but like i say if i can just zone in on being a, a, the best coach and helping the other guys and if i can help them even have a quarter of some of the life experiences and fight experiences and chances that i've had then that'll be great for them so there's a lot of promising young fighters in Bad Company Gym and a lot of promising young fighters around the UK. So if I can be a coach and help those guys and pass on everything that I've learned for over the years or my knowledge, and that's what I'd like to do. Obviously, in my seminars and stuff like that, I'll keep doing my tours around America and Canada. So I'll, I'll keep myself busy that way. And like You've I say, got the website as well, haven't you? Yeah, I've got my website yeah. as well, yeah. yeah. So like, there's no point me amassing all this information that, and that I have done like over the years, whether that's techniques on fighting or just experience or how to handle certain situations there's no point me having all this inside me and not giving it back so yeah. that's what i'd like to do so the website that's what a subscription yeah thing yeah you, yeah yeah liam harrison training um it's just like a sort of subscription site there's something on there for everyone from beginners to to pro fighters like a lot of my main clientele are actually gym owners from around the world who go on there and use all my videos to like you put uh, lesson plans together for their gym. So it's nice having that sort of impact on gyms in say in America and stuff for, I'm just from here. Do you know what I mean? So it's amazing knowing that like there's that, that many gyms, especially in like in America that have just subscribed to it and the message me going, Oh, amazing. And it, I get a lot of messages from fighters going, Oh, I drilled all this from your website and I won my fight from it. That's a good feeling. No, that I'm helping people like live the dream and fulfill the dream and stuff like that. That's nice. Yeah, well, you see, I mean, you see, obviously, I'm, I'm following you on the Instagram and that lot, and you see the the, the clips of the they're really well put together, actually, the, the the training techniques, and then how it's used in a real fight. And well, I was sick of people. I was just putting the, the training techniques up on f at first, and then you know what it's like on the internet that won't work in a fight. So I think you know what I'm fucking shite on on computers and anything like that as well. It took me about 15 hours to edit that first clip. I mean, I'll do this, edit it all together, put it up in there, tag the guy and put fuck you. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? From now on, I'll just keep doing it like that. Then no one can question you. If it's really effective, though, do you know what I mean? Because yeah, like you no say, no one can you, question you. Then. Yeah, hundred percent, mate, hundred percent. So uh, and you're doing your you're kicking it podcast as well. Yeah, I had done that. Do you know what? I started that in lockdown. It was just like I say, it was just to give me something to do because I'm going insane. Um, it's tough to to keep doing that when I'm training for a fight and stuff like that. I thought, shall I bring it back while I'm injured? And I thought, no, because then as soon as I start fighting, it's going to have to go again. So when yeah. I retire, that's kind like, of shelving it. Yeah, so yeah. And yeah. I, do you know what? I, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy talking to people and learning about the, yeah, you know, their yeah. stories and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I watched the, the Kevin Sinfield one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Great remember guy. Met, yeah, great guy. I mean, I, I, I'm a big Rhinos fan and I remember meeting him in the Players Bar once and I just forgot how to speak. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that, that's Kevin an inspirational Sif. guy right oh, there, yeah. mate. He's, he's some boy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Obviously, you, you did interview about the, the marathons that he did yeah. uh, for, for, for Rob Burrow and stuff like that. It was a yeah, great interview. Um, so, look, I'm going to finish off with a couple of questions, mate. Um, biggest lesson you can take from Thai boxing and, and training and fighting and put into everyday life or business or whatever it might be? Perseverance. Like I said, like, it goes back to the Mung Thai fight or... Goes back to that fight when I got battered by that tie. Don't give in, don't quit. You've got to just keep striving. And 
if you just let life knock you down like that, you, where you, like I said, you're never going to get to the top unless you persevere. You have to push through this. So that that's just the main lesson. You need to be disciplined. You need to be obsessed. If you want to get to the top, you need to be obsessed by what you're doing. Like I said, no one ever got rich by not coming out of the comfort zone. No one ever reached the top by not getting out of the comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. Persevere and be disciplined and obsessed by what you're doing. And that's what Muay Thai has taught me to do. Awesome, mate. Awesome. And one more. If you could go back to day one and do it all again, would you do anything differently? I wouldn't change a thing, mate. No, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I'm, I have got to where I am now from fighting how I fight and being who I am and doing what I do. Don't get me wrong, I made a few fucking stupid mistakes and I had a few stupid losses which shouldn't have happened, but they did. But it is what it is. You have to learn from these things and no point in saying, right, I'd go back and have every single fight a win. What the fuck would I learn then? In life, I wouldn't have learned anything. You win or you learn. Yeah, exactly. You you I've Absolutely. lost fights that have taught me lessons in life and... Yeah, I wouldn't change anything, mate, no. Awesome, mate, awesome. Well, look, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a super busy guy. Um, thanks so much, mate, for coming over. I really, really appreciate it. Anytime, I enjoyed that. Nice Hope one. the knee recovery goes uh, well and uh, be looking out for your fighting in January, mate. All the best for it. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Liam. Time, mate. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. And if you need any more information on the Mansformation programme, just hit the link below.